Additive manufacture enables rapid construction of novel antenna designs in configurations not achievable by conventional machining from materials with enhanced strength and heat flux tolerance while reducing machining steps and enabling complex RF structures to be printed monolithically. I'm Andrew Seltzman from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and today I will be discussing our work on additive manufacturing applied to the construction of a lower hybrid RF launcher. A high field side lower hybrid launcher for improved efficiency off axis current drive in D3D is under construction at MIT. Designs from oxygen free copper are not suitable as the 400 Celsius bakeouts result in annealing to 50 MPa yield strength that would result in damage during disruption loads that require 200 MPa yield strength. The bakeout temperature also precludes copper plating of ink and L as the copper would diffuse into the base metal increasing resistance and RF losses. Additive manufacture from a high strength copper alloy addressed these design constraints. A CAD model of the launcher structure is shown on the left. The launcher structure is broken up into segments for 3D printing to accommodate build plate space constraints, shown in the middle, and subsequently laser welded into a complete structure, shown on the right. A novel high field side launcher, shown on the top, includes a traveling wave poloidal splitter and aperture impedance matching structure, as shown in the middle, to reduce peak electric field below the multi-pactor breakdown limit. Elimination of the standing wave power splitter design used on the Alcator CMOD launcher with a traveling wave splitter reduces peak electric field by 20%. While multi-junction launchers exploit interference of circulating power to return reflected power back to the plasma, the resulting standing waves within the launcher increase electric field, limiting power handling capability. By integrating a thin inductive impedance matching structure into each waveguide aperture to match waveguide impedance to plasma surface impedance, reflections that drive standing waves are reduced. By selecting an appropriate matching element height, the optimum coupling region, indicated by the lowest electric field, shown plotted on the bottom in green, may be centered on the expected edge density, indicated by the blue horizontal line. As matching element height is increased, the range of density for optimum coupling is decreased and centered around the expected target density. In this manner, a launcher may be specifically matched to expected edge conditions. The complexity of the matching structure and traveling wave divider is enabled by additive manufacturing techniques. While conventional machining of poloidal splitter and phase shifter frames from copper chromium zirconium alloy is possible, loss of strength would occur due to annealing at bakeout temperatures in D3D. Conventional machining requires internal access to mill matching elements in the poloidal splitters, as shown on the top. This design includes a frame machine from copper stock, shown in the middle, and cover plate that forms the waveguide broad wall. During splitter assembly, electron beam or laser welding of the cover plate onto the splitter frame results in warping of the cover plate and bowing of the frame due to the heat input and contraction at the weld joint, as shown on the bottom. Additive manufacture eliminates internal machining and welding of cover plates, increases component strength, and reduces construction time at the expense of limited build volume, residual surface roughness, and required vertical support on overhanging structures. Complete parts, shown here, including diagnostic horns, waveguides, phase shifters, and ploidal splitters, are printed monolithically, enabling the design of complex RF structures. Additive manufacturing is an enabling technology for launcher and waveguide structures. Using a laser powder bed fusion process, the powder is dispersed on the surface of a build plate with a coder blade. A cross section of the part is consolidated by melting with a scanning laser under an inert argon atmosphere. The build plate retracts downward by the layer height and the process repeats. A build plate can be completed in two weeks at a cost of ten to twenty thousand dollars. Powder costs $300 per kilogram, however, powder not consolidated during printing is reusable. Current build volumes are limited to 250 by 250 by 300 millimeters, as filling larger volumes with powder would be prohibitively expensive. Launchers are printed from GR COP84 gas atomized powder. Developed for additive manufacture of rocket engine combustion chambers, shown on the right, Glenn Research Copper 84 maintains high strength at high temperatures and heat fluxes exceeding 100 megawatts per square meter, 
conditions similar to the first wall of a fusion reactor. Niobium chromide precipitates, consisting of 8 atomic percent chromium and 4 atomic percent niobium in the alloy, form during the rapid cooling of gas atomized powder, increasing tensile strength. Additive manufactured GRCOP84 achieves mechanical properties exceeding conventionally manufactured copper alloys and GRCOP consolidated through hot isostatic pressing or extrusion from powder. Laser powder bed fusion refines precipitate size compared to gas atomized powder by either breaking apart precipitates within the powder or dissolving them into the melt and re-precipitating them during the rapid resolidification of the laser melt pool. Precipitate size distribution in powder grains are plotted in the box plot on the right, while average precipitate size in as printed GRCOP84 is indicated by the blue horizontal line. The resulting precipitate distribution is smaller than the precipitates within the initial powder stock. As two-thirds of the strength of GRCOP84 comes from precipitates by the Orowan mechanism, the greater number of small precipitates results in material much stronger than can be achieved if material was consolidated using hipping or extrusion from powder, where the initial precipitate size is maintained during the consolidation process. Precipitates in gas atomized powder, shown top left, printed GRCOP84, shown middle left, and printed GRCOP84 following a 900 Celsius 5 hour heat treatment, shown bottom left. Heat treatment of additively manufactured GRCOP84 controls precipitate size to select desired tensile properties. A 450 Celsius 3 hour heat treatment increases yield strength to 790 megapascal and ultimate tensile strength to 970 megapascal at the expense of ductility, while a 900 Celsius 5 hour heat treatment reduces tensile strength while improving ductility and results in saturated coarsening of precipitates. The resulting yield strength of 300 megapascals exceeds the 200 megapascal yield strength required to withstand disruption loads. As precipitate coarsening is saturated, no further changes in tensile strength of the launcher are expected during subsequent bakeouts. Additive manufacture of phase shifters eliminated internal machining of tapers and welding of cover plates. Phase shifters used to construct the launcher, shown on the left, include a tapered broad wall height, shown in the middle. Phase shifters to construct three launchers are printed per build plate, shown on the right, with dimensional accuracy falling within 10 to 40 microns of specified values. Internal supports are required to prevent collapse of the waveguide ceiling into a horizontally printed waveguide. A 5 mm diameter horizontal hole printed without supports is shown on the left, illustrating collapse of an overhanging ceiling. Printing of supports, shown on the right, prevents ceiling collapse. However, support removal requires physical access and produces a rough surface prohibiting their use in an enclosed RF structure. The RF structure of horizontally printed poloidal splitters is modified for compatibility with the additive manufacturing process by utilizing a pentagonal waveguide cross-section, shown on the left, which supports the waveguide ceiling with a 45 degree chamfer connecting to the sidewalls. This modification prevents ceiling collapse while eliminating the need for internal supports. The junction between the pentagonal waveguide cross-section in the poloidal splitter, shown on the left, and the rectangular cross-section of the phase shifter creates a step discontinuity in waveguide cross-section, shown magnified on the right. The RF properties of a pentagonal waveguide carrying the TE10 mode and the reflection from this discontinuity are further examined in the following slide. For waveguide with a high aspect ratio between broad and narrow walls, the impedance and mode structure of a pentagonal or hexagonal waveguide are almost identical to a rectangular waveguide. The impedance of a waveguide with chamfered walls is equivalent to that of a rectangular waveguide with a reduction in broad wall height of equivalent area, as shown on the top left. For such high aspect ratio waveguides, reflection from a junction between pentagonal and rectangular waveguide cross sections is negligible. A return loss before, below negative 37 dB is expected for 5 mm narrow wall width waveguide. Finite element and analytical models of reflection versus narrow wall width are plotted in the bottom right. Analytical formulas for impedance transform and reflection coefficients of a rectangular waveguide broad wall step discontinuity, shown on the bottom left, are nearly identical 
to finite element models of a pentagonal rectangular junction, shown top right, allowing rapid estimation of design performance without developing a finite element model. Reduction in waveguide cross-section due to the chamfer results in a slight increase in electric field. The safe operating area, shown in green for a rectangular cross-section ploidal splitter, plotted on the left, is reduced in a pentagonal cross-section ploidal splitter plotted on the right. A wide margin in operating density is still achieved by both designs. Chemical mechanical polishing smooths inaccessible internal surfaces with a combination of chemical and mechanical action. For low RF loss, the RMS surface roughness should be less than the skin depth of the material as plotted in the top right. In copper at 4.6 GHz, this skin depth is 1 micron and commercially produced extruded waveguide achieves roughnesses of approximately 0.4 microns. An SEM micrograph of an S printed surface with RMS roughness of 4.1 microns is shown on the top left. A slurry of etching chemicals and abrasive beads are passed through the internal structure of the phase shifters and power splitters. As illustrated in the middle left, an initial rough surface, shown in 1, reacts with the chemical etchants that simultaneously etches and coats the copper surface with a chemical resist layer in two. The motion of the abrasive beads wears off the resist layer from the peaks but not the valleys of the surface in three. Further etching of the peaks then occurs in four. This process is continued until the surface is polished flat. After CMP, the roughness is reduced to 0.4 microns as shown on the bottom left resulting in low RF loss. On the bottom right, poloidal splitters are shown prior to and following chemical mechanical polishing. All surface roughness due to the additive manufacturing process has been removed. To prevent sputtering and erosion, a titanium zirconium molybdenum limiter is bonded to the plasma facing surface of each launcher aperture. Active braces are utilized to join TZM to GRCOP84. GRCOP84 has brazing characteristics similar to oxygen-free copper and copper chromium zirconium and exhibits good wetting with both copper silver and copper gold based brazes. Concurrent good wetting of GRCOP84 and TZM is achieved with the use of active brazes, eliminating the need for plating the TZM. Palhusil 25 was selected to braze the limiters onto the launcher apertures as a high melting temperature prevents softening during potential neutral beam strikes on the launcher face. Due to the difference in coefficient of thermal expansion between GRCOP84 and TZM, a TZM GRCOP84 TZM sandwich, as shown on the top, is used to balance out stresses and prevent bowing of the braze assembly as it cools. Aperture limiters are then wire EDM cut from the braze plates and laser welded onto the ploidal splitters, as shown on the bottom. Due to space constraints, the entire launcher will not fit on a single build plate, as shown on the bottom, requiring manufacturing in segments, and subsequent laser welding during final assembly. During assembly, aperture limiters are first welded onto the ploidal splitters. The thin phase shifters are welded onto the RF window sleeves, followed by the ploidal splitter inputs. Pairs of thin phase shifters are welded together along an internal septum and welded onto the thick phase shifters. Three thick phase shifters are finally welded together along the septums and welded onto the taper transition connecting to the feeding waveguide. The assembly requires 40 butt welds around the perimeter of waveguide components and five edge welds along internal septums. Welding of each launcher can be completed in approximately 12 hours. Launcher segments require support and alignment during assembly to produce good weld joints and prevent distortion. Fixture plates are designed to align launcher components during welding while allowing beam access on both top and bottom surfaces during perimeter welds. Unlike many copper alloys, GRCOP84 has excellent laser welding properties due to good coupling with neodymium YAG and fiber lasers in the 1064 to 1070 nanometer range. Top and bottom surfaces of full penetration weld beads are smooth with minimal spatter. Welds maintained a 450 megapascal ultimate tensile strength. The first additive manufactured lower hybrid current drive launcher was completed at MIT in October. Additive manufacturing enabled a novel RF design and resulted in improved mechanical properties 
while surface roughness was addressed with chemical mechanical polishing. Future launcher designs may be printed as monolithic units eliminating welding.